gurus are not only not what they should be, they are absurdly wide of the mark. I mean, when you read Kriyananda's biography of his guru, Paramahansa Yogananda, it's a living proof that his guru is not enlightened. Miracles abound and absurd statements of aggrandizement. It's not that it would deceive the very elect were it possible, it's just blatantly obvious. Quite simply, there is nothing more phony than religion. It has an incredible propensity to go astray. I mean, you know, they say power corrupts. But nothing corrupts more than saintly adoration. Adoration of the saints. What should be a saint turns out to be a tele-evangelist. The whole world just looks on in absolute mockery (laughs) of such. And with good reason. First principle of life is still everything. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind and strength. And thy neighbour, the one that rescues you, as yourself. The rest is rubbish, noise. We have it in the Jesus story that he came to tell us God's name. That it's Father, Heavenly Dad, if you like. And that he loves us. The rest is trivial by comparison. And it makes salvation extremely available to all. All you have to be is thankful to God. To have life eternal. Thank you, Dad. You see, to love God is to love the personification of your values. You you can't love anything else. And from it, your living reveals to you where you wish to change your view of God because your values have adjusted according to your experience of living. The advice that you consider, be it from scripture or from people, the observations that you make of what's in the world and those around you and how it affects you, and your experience of doing living according to your values and experiencing it, doing so and experiencing the consequences. These all adjust constantly what your values are at present and your view of God, therefore. If you worship the personification of God being the personification of those values.
if you try to value something that's not the personification of what you value, you find it alienating. That's not life. That's discord and lack of creative growing in the way you wish to grow. Spiritually. Now, I mean, the simplest way of personifying what you value is to imagine um, God as being your dad and a perfect loving dad. Therefore, you're very favoured because you're his child. You know you can trust on and rely on such a such a God, such a person, such a parent. So it's a simple way of saying to us, um, well, one should, I suppose, adjust the principle to thou shalt love uh, thy heavenly dad with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And um, in that regard, you're taking for granted that your heavenly dad is the epitome of caring relationship that you value. Well, because it's extremely easy, it's automatic now to love such a God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. In other words, live accordingly. And you anticipate that such will bring joy and happiness and peace of mind and hope and meaning to life. And in as far as it doesn't, you must question automatically, well, what have I got wrong here? What am I misunderstanding? Do I value such and such after all? might be um, certain practices that you sort of think they don't seem to achieve what I value, or following certain teaching, or following certain people, gurus or whatever. And perhaps you find after a while, well, I'm not sure if this is really what I value. So you adjust your view of what you value. And you adjust your view of what your perfect God is. You might um, see God not only as a heavenly dad, but divine mother. Because perhaps that incorporates into your view of God uh, other qualities, not just what you've associated with being a dad. You may even come to a conclusion that, no, it's really dearest friend, or wonderful friend, or perfect friend. So, if you like, we've escaped the gender problem now, haven't we? And we've gone for an astonishing equality view now. So is this your card? the perfect friend, as you understand it. And that perfection will again adjust according to your experience of living accordingly. And then, if you like, the great safety thing is that we're assuming that our wonderful God loves and cares for us and will guide and correct us where we got the wrong impression or we're under delusion or we misunderstand because he's a wonderful person that loves us and we love him. So 
So there's a built-in safety uh, aspect of our com conception of God, that he is loving and caring for us, of course, and therefore will guide us through. We trust that. And in fact, this is confirmed with each change we make as well, for we make a change for what we understand to be the better. Oh, such and such perhaps wasn't a good idea, you know, I mean, perhaps it's drinking tap water, you know. perhaps it's chlorine is not the best thing to shove in the stomach, uh, or um, what's the other thing they put in now? Uh, well, I can't think, but you know, anything they put in the water, so. And um, so, you know, you feel, yes, he's guiding me. Thank you, Dad. And the great help in this relationship, as I've said, as you know, is to practice thankfulness. We focus on what serves as good. In other words, you're preoccupied with a consciousness of every aspect of your God, whether it's the loveliness of nature around you, or the people you know, or the things you do, or, or the things you think, or your very body and being, and, and I don't mean or, I mean and, I don't know, all, all of these things. you become very hopeful as you realize how wonderfully God has provided for you from your awakening consciousness of life onwards. That he's come to your rescue and sorted things out and provided endlessly every breath you take, every thought you have, every goodness. It's a great optimism that grows, a great um, trust and assurance, you see. You're filled with hope. Hope is the very essence of life. Without hope, you do nothing. There must be some expectation of the possibility of gain or you don't lift your hand to do a thing. So we don't condemn the ego. The ego there is to keep you on life's track, to keep you alive, to protect you, to make that a priority. After all, if you're not here in this universe, you can't learn from it. So the ego's come to make sure you stay in this universe. And, and, and you don't deny that. It's not that you don't love and care for other people, but you cannot love and care for other people if you're dead and not here. Well, perhaps you can in some spiritual way, but, you know, a great deal of our preoccupation is being here physically alive, and the ego is principally concerned with maintaining that, <laughs> that you stay alive. It's been sent, given by God, if you like, as a, a tremendous blessing that you stay in the school, to learn and be blessed into life eternal from this experience of living. So we're very grateful for the ego. We're not slaying it, destroying it, or going to dismiss it as uh, an illusion. Yourself, we take to be something God appreciates. You're his child, you see. Your conceiving of God in that way, or, or your his dearest friend, but either way, he values you greatly. How lovely, what a beautiful person to know. This is life eternal, to know thee, the only true God, the one you find to be true. You find to be true. And that does change. It's the whole point of being in this classroom. You come to know him, hopefully extremely well. 
to do that, to be thankful, is, is the very essence of being a good student. You're enjoying the lesson. Oh, we can teach you so much more if you enjoy the lesson. And it's a pleasure for you to come. And we do all we can to make the lesson nice for you. Because we love you. Save the wonderful teacher, the wonderful aid. And he is your teacher, no one else. His Holy Spirit only. The one that speaks only of him. According to the Jesus story, you see, you're conceiving of the teacher being within you, not externally, not some uh, misunderstood external person, but someone within. It's the spirit of your brain, your dad, isn't it? It's his son, spiritually speaking guiding you, caring for you. In fact, I would say, it's mum, it's divine mum. It's, it's his aspect of loving and caring and nurturing. Because he's not just male, he's, he's all, the, all, all the blessings and goodness of what we understand to be male and what we understand to be female. So we see the Son as female, the Holy Spirit, wisdom, guidance. She's helping you and leading you day and night, night and day. She's holding you in your, her arms, spiritually speaking, you see, caring for you. She wants you to have life. You're a child. She's bringing you into life eternal. She has hopes of all things wonderful for your future, that you're going to be magnificent, like her, like your dad, like your mum, you see? God is both. This caring aspect we think of as his spiritual son, but really, no, it's... It's mum, isn't it? It's the female aspect of God, the caring. And perhaps that's not your idea, that's not what you value at present. Fine. The principle still holds, though, that you love your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Heart, soul, mind, and strength. Yeah? And that you trust that your God will guide you into the fullness of understanding of, of him. Bless you. And you are blessed. You're a child of God. And if you are a child of God, you're going to become a magnificent, wonderful friend of God as an adult in his his family, his heavenly house, the kingdom of heaven, which, according to the Jesus story, is within you. So you look within, not without to the world and teachers and gurus and ministers and leaders and experts and, you know, but within. You know, again, in the, in the Jesus story, the notion is that he's prayed that God dwells in you, and that you receive the Holy Spirit to guide you into all blessedness, into life eternal. You will worship according to your understanding, your story. I've given you what I take to be mine. But you will worship and love according to your view. And I hope very much you'll be at the same time trusting that your God is ever guiding you in the right direction. And loving you. It would be 
upset to love a God that didn't love you. You don't know anything, you just trust. Why not trust in that which you truly value? Rather than choose what you don't truly value? That's a nonsense. That would be madness. How could you want to trust in what you don't value? It would be a self-contradiction, wouldn't it? How lovely. We found what presents as the best way to go. And you'll go that way until you think otherwise. And perhaps you'll never think otherwise. You'll find that it does indeed lead to all the blessings and happiness that you truly value. Bless you.